online teaching is now more relevant in this period of COVID-19 lockdown than ever in the history. More and more institutions are now migrating to complete online teaching. For example, see the University of Cambridge have recently announced that for the next one and a half years, all the teaching will be entirely online. I've been to online teaching for many years now. I also have a full-fledged MOOC that is massively open online course at UGC Swayam platform of Government of India. According to me, number one limitation for online teaching here in India or anywhere in developed country is the internet speed. Bandwidth is important too because data is not so cheap. Conserving the data is extremely important. So how to get things done with online teaching with low internet speed as well as bandwidth? What is ICT? ICT is nothing but information and communication technologies. This term has been used for the last one or two decades by educationists but the real meaning of this ICT is nobody knows. It's still a vague term. So it's kind of jargonish as well you know and the people interpret according to their convenience. So the basic trouble everywhere especially here in India. So people refer this ICT as you know some people say it is just OHT or some people say it is a online teaching. So in one sense education are making this term deliberately jargonish in, to give an impression that you know the trainers are really super or smart but actually this is a wrong practice. I have an inherent detest against the term ICT. In addition many educationists believe that online teaching is all about ICT again it's a vague term and also the learning management system or LMS many enterprise branded versions are now coming up and many people think that unless you are into this LMS platform you are not actually into the online teaching so again that is a total misconception. LMS is yet another jargon to demotivate the teachers. So the teachers are traditionally tech hours, I would say. They are not really into the technology and they are more into philosophy and reading habits, isn't it? So they are not really into the technology. So just to demotivate them, you are bombarding the teachers with, you know, this jargon. So this is not a good practice. By the way, are this LMS a simple solution? So it is not so simple, friends. You know, for example, Moodle, you might have heard of, or Google Classroom or Pearson success net or haiku net most of these LMS solutions require a steep learning curve so it takes really many months to be familiarized with all these systems you know and lots of time requirement as well for learning the software and also to update the contents manually every time you deliver a class you have to update everything manually so this additional time requirement is drastically eats up the time from the teachers busy schedule otherwise can be devoted to reading and making effective classes and not taking so this is the problem that why most of the teachers are not really into the online teaching these days so the trend is that teachers do start with the Moodle. They attend the Moodle uh, training or other LMS training workshop and they start with this content dissemination through the Litmos or Moodle. But when they realize the quantum of the inevitable works, they simply quit completely. This is what is happening in reality. Well, there are so many other misconceptions about the online teaching. One I've already mentioned to you that online teaching is equal to ICT or LMS. Well, the reality is entirely different. Online teaching is not equal to ICT or LMS. Yet another misconception is that or which is rather I would say biggest misconception is that the online teaching is all about the video conferencing, which is in reality entirely optional especially in situations like this when the internet speed is very low at most places in our country here in India especially during this lockdown COVID-19 lockdown period you see and even that video component is entirely optional will you believe it you can conduct a great online teaching without a single video component in it it's possible friends I have been doing that for quite some time now and also I have taken a great course elements of AI so this is given by uh, University of Helsinki. It's one of the most popular MOOCs in the world, you know, and it's from the Finland. Not a single video in the whole MOOC. So it is a totally online course, but without a single video component. I have recently conducted an online survey to see how the students in India perceive the online teaching or online learning rather uh, in these changed conditions of the, you know, the lockdown period, right? So the online, the, the results of the survey is really starking. If you look at the primary device that uh, the students access for the online learning, so you can see that 75.9% uh, have answered that they are using 
mobile phone or tablet while only 24 percentage one are using uh, computers so if you are giving an online teaching targeted to the computer or laptop or a window system that is not at all going to be effective you should design your contents in such a way that your target is uh, you know the, the students are accessing it through the mobile phones and yet another interesting trend which I observed in my survey is that majority of students are from poor economic background. So it is like 67.4 percentage are from the lower middle class rather than comparing with 32.6 percentage from the upper middle class or affluent families. So affordability is very important. So inclusivity is one dimension that you have to consider while delivering uh, your content through the online. So for online teaching to be inclusive, we should mind that most students are from low economic background from rural areas and they use mobile phones and have very low internet speed and bandwidth. And that is one reason that I have decided to release this video on this specific problem of the low internet speed or bandwidth. By the way, a guiding principle of my life is Oxham's Razor concept of philosophy, friends. It's proposed by 14th century British philosopher William of Oxham. So the Oxham's Razor is all about simplicity. So if a simple solution can get things done, why would you go for a complicated solution? For example, a simple straight razor can uh, give me a, a nice shave. Then why would I go for a shaver with you know, two blades or three blades, you know, even there are uh, advertisement. I have recently seen swipe advertisement that says six blade cartridge. Where will this, you know, the number of cartridge stop? Seven, eight, 10, 20, 30? I don't know. Where will it go? Why would you go for or look at the brown advertisement? Such a huge technological advancement. But for what reason? If a simple straight razor give you a very nice cut that has been used for, you know, many centuries, isn't it? For the last few centuries, for sure. And um, they, they didn't have any problem. So right now, is it a big problem to have to go for this kind of complicated solutions? Not really. Or look at the case with soap, you know, what kind of soap will you use? Uh, for example, will you be using this L'Oreal Men Expert, uh, you know, Hydra Energetic, this is nothing but a shower gel or, uh, you know, you, you'll be confused to use a hand sanitizer, isn't it? So this kind of Purell or Dettol hand sanitizer or, uh, you know, this is nothing but the liquid soap for uh, hand soap, right, to wash the hands. Why would you need all these complicated solutions, friends? If a simple soap, a bar of soap can do it. For the last many decades, the humanity have been using this bar soap and they were just fine, you know, and we don't have any extra problem for these complicated solutions. So in my perception, most of this technical sounding jargon, you know, for example, Hydra or Aqua, these are nothing but water, you know, this is nothing but propaganda words that used by advertisement for misinformation, you know. So the same way LMS or ICT, this kind of jargon is the biggest turn off for uh, online teaching adoption by the teachers of this country, I would say. So you might wonder what is the crux of today's talk. So it's nothing but the Oxam's Razor friends and I suggest a quadrivium solution for uh, online teaching adoption. The quadrivium is nothing but four part solution. The first part is content dissemination. You should find a way to disseminate the contents. By the way, there is a philosophical dimension to this problem. Are the teachers mere content providers? I will come to that in a short while. The second aspect of online learning is two-way interaction. It's very important to foster two-way interaction. And the third one is a way or a mean to foster communication among the peer group as well as teacher to the student. And the fourth one is for assessment. We need to find a way to assess or grade the student's progress, you see. A good example of Oxam's Razor concept adopted in online learning is the same course which I told you earlier, Elements of AI. It's very simple, intuitive and address all the four issues in the most optimal way. Let us first talk about the content dissemination. The content dissemination is nothing but to disseminate the contents of the course, be it lecture handouts. In addition, you can disseminate lecture audio or video, which is optional but is quite beneficial for many students. And the contents can also include PDF of the 
you know the full text articles or PPTs of your presentations or notices that you would like to deliver to your students or other instructional materials and podcasts and suggested reading like in PDF or suggested videos you know linked up videos to the other YouTube videos all these are examples of different contents that you can disseminate to your students and what is my suggestion my suggestion is a very simple solution that is called Google Sites with Dropbox or the Google Drive and the YouTube so you might wonder why the Google Sites is better than Google Classroom. Google Classroom is, you might know, it is an LMS learning management system. So the biggest advantage of the Sites is that Sites is a static page. You know, your entire your course contents will remain there forever. So it is an amazing site. So you really don't need to update every time. You know so much lesser effort so we all know the teachers are already busy with many of the works that we do that another big advantage is that it's open to the world you know you really don't need any sign in to access the content so it actually uh, dramatically reduces the bandwidth usage you know just that students have to click on a website and access all the contents and it facilitates the learning process Another biggest advantage is that the students need not to install any apps and it's natively supported across mobile devices because Google site is designed by the Google engineers and they're quite smart. You know the Google sites you can access in on a mobile phone or a computer or a tablet. Uh, you know the sites display perfectly well. I will take you to my course website to show you how it works. Well, this is my course website. To go to this website, you can simply Google my name and click on the first link. Or you can go to that URL underneath the globe icon, icon of my website. You know, that is nothing but bit.ly forward slash Felix Lab. It's a collapsible submenu. So all I have to do is to click on it to open the contents. For example, if I open this molecular systematics, you can see that resources. This is what you call the contents to disseminate on the site. For example, the PPT and uh, the book, all these things I can disseminate over the site. You know, and the videos, all these videos are hosted in the YouTube. You know, if I click on it, it will go to the YouTube and then that particular, let me click on the first link, the phonetics. So you can see that the videos are hosted in the YouTube and the students can watch the videos and students can download the contents as well with the, uh, the third party solutions like, uh, you know, the PWN YouTube and also the students can comment below this uh, course itself so that they can clarify the doubts right over in the YouTube, you know, so it fosters a two way interaction as well, but I will come to the two way interaction later. Going back to my website, you can see that even there are podcasts here. So the podcast is nothing but recorded radio show. You can, uh, the students can just click on it to play the content of this show. So it's really convenient for, uh, you know, the uh, low internet bandwidth areas or when the speed of the internet is very low. So why YouTube is better than live video conferencing? Probably you know that Zoom or Meet or Skype uh, students, uh, you know, attend the online teaching and the teachers deliver the contents. They give a lecture and students listen to that lecture. So that is called video conferencing, isn't it? So it needs a lot of bandwidth, friends. YouTube natively adapts the bandwidth and the speed so it is really really good so remember that i have conducted a recent survey and i asked the students what is the biggest advantage of online teaching so one of the biggest advantage that most of the students have uh, responded to my survey is that flexi time so flexi time means that ability to pause and watch the videos again and take the class even when you're absent on the scheduled day or oh, these two are really big advantage the flexi time is a big advantage of online teaching but both of these advantages the flexi time is not possible if you are conducting the video over the zoom for example if the student is uh, you know busy on that particular day he or she will be missing that content right so she or he cannot even uh, rewind or replay the content uh, the videos that you deliver to the zoom so these things are only possible if you host your content on the YouTube by the way ability to pause and rewind and watch the video again is extremely important in pedagogy friends you know 19th century german psychologist called hermann ebbinghaus have propounded something called exponential nature of forgetting so the idea is that after we learn something for example if we read a book or the students take a lecture you know within one hour so you can see that the retention here the y-axis represent the retention percentage that means how much of the information we retrieve in 
our mind while the x-axis represent the elapsed time since learning you know it's just one hour this is one month so as you can see just after within one hour the retention has gone to 50 percentage so that means we forget almost 50 percentage of the content just within one hour of listening to an online lecture it's dramatic friends and most of the teachers overlook this problem this is inherent problem friends even how we review the content matters so there are two kinds of reviewing the content one is called blocked learning another is called interleaved learning so blocked learning means you know you are looking at for example the unit one uh, again and again and again and once you complete the unit one you go to the unit two again and again and again so this is called blocked learning Inversely, another kind of learning is called interweaved learning where you are actually interweave the contents all mixed up together A, B, C then comes again A, B, C again you learn the same thing A, B, C this kind of learning that means sections from unit 1 then unit 2 and unit 3 again you go back to unit 1, 2, 3 this is called interleaved learning and many of the recent pedagogical papers argue in favor of interleaved learning for better memory retention. So it's important that students get a chance to review the lecture again and again. That is the exact reason storing your videos in YouTube is a lot more beneficial than delivering it over Zoom or any other video conferencing platforms because it enables a student to watch anytime, rewind, pause and so on. Your lectures stay there forever or I would say until the YouTube closes which I wouldn't expect in any time sooner. And if you think of existential philosophy, you know, even after your death friends, you know, even after my death, my videos will be there on the YouTube and students can watch it. For example, I recently watched a video on how to perform vibrato on the violin by an instructor who is very old. The video itself is very old and I googled it. The, the instructor was long dead. But still, you see, her teachings are everlasting. That is the beauty of online teaching. Another biggest advantage is the bandwidth usage because it just uses only one time while uploading the contents to the YouTube. You really don't want to use it again and again. But in the case of Zoom, this is not the case. The Zoom eats up your bandwidth each time you deliver a real-time lecture. So YouTube also enables a student to download that video, you know, so, so that the students can rewatch without consuming much of the bandwidth. So this is available through the third party tools, for example, PWN. PWN is a very interesting tool to download the YouTube videos. And I do that most of the time because that enables me to conserve my bandwidth as well. If you don't know how to use PWN, which is rather a trick on the URL, please Google it and learn it yourself. If you would like to record your videos and put it in the YouTube, of course, you need to know how to edit the videos, right? For video editing, my recommendation is DaVinci Resolve, which is a free software with advanced non-linear editing potentials and a lot of free YouTube videos, how to use DaVinci Resolve. And if you want to record the screen, just like how I'm doing right now to deliver this talk, for recording the videos, I suggest another open source software called OBS Studio, which is totally free. And guess what? As I told you earlier, video is entirely optional you can get the things done with just the audio component alone here comes podcast one of the highly overlooked technological integration of online learning here in india what is podcast by the way podcast is nothing but recorded audio show just like a normal radio but the difference is that podcast is delivered online though podcasting sounds so technical but it's actually very simple how to do that just share the mp3 files you know on your website instead of the video file or the youtube link just share the mp3 or drag and drop the mp3 file that's it you're done biggest advantage with the podcast is that it takes only a fraction of the bandwidth it's very good for online teaching if your primary audience is students from economically underprivileged section and podcast is so much better than community radio or ham radio in this connected world because people have a lot more mobile phones than radios you see more than that community radio or ham radios reach is extremely limited only a very limited number of students can access you know mostly within 100 kilometers range but the podcast is limitless friends if you put something on your internet website for example the podcast that i share in my website even the students from sub-saharan africa or south america can access it and if the whole idea of podcast sound too techy simple solution would be record your lectures and then share that mp3 files via slack or what's up well instead of sharing the raw audio file i still suggest you to edit the content so for audio editing my recommendation is audacity which is a free open source software 
Editing your audios before sharing to remove the unwanted parts or silence is very important because it significantly reduces the file size and it's good for low bandwidth internet connections. By the way, to store the contents in my website, for example, PPT or PDF files, I use cloud-based platform called Dropbox. Of course, you can use Google Drive as well. And why would you need to use this cloud-based backup too? The biggest advantage is that it provides something called static URL. URL is nothing but universal resource locator. It's nothing but website address. So that means contents in the websites are automatically updated when we save our changes. That is the very important thing. For example, while going through your lecture slides in the PowerPoint, you noticed a spelling mistake. So you just have to correct that spelling mistake and click Control S. So it is automatically reflected in the cloud. So you really don't have to change this URL manually each time you know you make these changes so no need to upload and manually update the urls every time when we modify a file that is the biggest advantage of using this cloud-based backup tools storing in the cloud also let you overcome the space restrictions in the google sites and it saves a ton of bandwidth as well no need to upload or email again and again or back and forth with the students and teachers. Second option for the content dissemination is Google Classroom while I do not recommend it. What is Google Classroom by the way? It is nothing but various Google services like Form, Groups, Calendar, etc. repacked as a learning management system. Google Classroom is like a blog where the teachers post various materials and update the stream. Google Classroom is targeted at school level with many guardian control so it is really not good for higher education especially if you teach in a college or a university plus biggest turn off with google site is that it needs a lot of time to update the contents daily well this is how the google classroom looks like as you can see here this is nothing but the stream with lots of pause so the teachers have to be manually updated so you really need a lot of time to update the contents on the google classroom well where is the time for teachers I would say this is just a clerical job and teachers are not meant for that. Teachers are meant to read and take notes and deliver fantastic content. So that concludes the section on content dissemination. Now going to the second important component of online teaching is two-way interaction. You might wonder why to go for two-way interaction. What is the problem with one-way interaction? One-way interactions are didactic monologues friends and it's not effective at all. No feedbacks or no critical reflections. So progress of the student is very slow. Examples of the one-way learning includes TV, for example, Doordarshan's Gyan Darshan or Swayam Prabha channel, radio or websites or UGC's EPG Padashala or TEDx or TED Talks or books. Off late, there had been a gradual shift from teacher-centric one-way transactional mode, which are monologues, to student-centric two-way transactional modes, which are dialogues. This shift began since the beginning of 20th century because two-way learning is far more effective. By the way, have you ever wondered how we learn, how the students learn? A landmark paper published in 2003 is all about social constructivist theory of the pedagogy friends. And since then, a large number of studies have revealed the trend that students do not learn much in the classrooms or when you deliver the lectures. As you can see in this picture, the lecture and reading the retention rate is just 5 to 10 percentage while audio visual demonstration is 20 to 30 percentage 50 percentage of the retention is when the students engage in the so-called discussion group or peer group discussion and 75 percentage is when the students practice by doing while 90 percentage is when the students teach others you know or immediate use of the things that they learn that is exactly what you call micro teaching by the students so peer group discussion and critical reflections are extremely important component of the online teaching though not many teachers pay attention to these aspects so how to foster two-way learning in the online learning there are so many ways online web forum is a very simple solution you can use google group for that Google group offers threaded conversation and participate with simple email response. For example, consider an unknown student from South America accessing the contents in my website and he or she is 
posing a question in the Google groups that is embedded in my website and suddenly I'll be notified via an email and to respond to that threaded conversation all I have to do is to click reply and respond an email for real-time audio conferencing that is nothing but group audio call my suggestion is Jitsi which is an open source software I have provided a brief introduction to how to use Jitsi including the trainer video link is given in the description section of this video or you can use Google meet as well for more advanced group interactions you can use group writing assignments where many students work on the same document for that I suggest Google Docs you can also try virtual whiteboard for mind map assignment for that my recommendation is Google drawing Google group is actually very simple it has been on for the last one decade and the groups can easily be integrated in to the Google sites you know the website that you create for your web page so it's really convenient and this is how the Google Docs looks like that many students can work on the same document every changes that the students and teachers do are reflected in everywhere so it saves a lot of bandwidth you really don't have to upload and download again and again and send the email back and forth Google drawing is also very convenient way for mind map or virtual background kind of assignment for example I create a central node and I ask the students to expand this central node to connect this concept to illustrate how these concepts are interlinked and interrelated the so-called mind maps of course the students need not log in to edit these mind maps because these are stored in the Google drawing so for two-way interaction my simple solution is that I ask my students to watch my videos in the YouTube or listen to the podcast hosted at my website and follow the guidelines on learning trajectory and be prepared and then come for the group audio discussion you see the peer group discussions and question and answer session during the audio conferencing or physical classroom this is exactly what you call it as flipped classroom concept you know a best way to implement a flipped classroom concept is just to provide the materials so that students can watch the videos and prepare the contents beforehand and come for group discussions with the audio conferencing third aspect of the online teaching is communication communication or instant messaging is central to the online learning because it enables us to keep in touch with our students with push notification that is notification on their mobile devices of course there are many ways to communicate with the students for example email or whatsapp or slack the problem with email is that it's not an instantaneous and email overload is a genuine problem and also for very brief messages email is not at all convenient so options for instant messaging are either whatsapp or slack or any number of other solutions signal is a very good platform too if you care for the security and privacy well my personal preference is slack because slack has got a lot of controls it's more fluid and less intrusive than whatsapp takes so much less bandwidth too and works well with low internet speed ability to create channels or subgroups is the biggest advantage of the slack files that you share in the slack stays there forever new members can read old messages and access old files can integrate with many services like Dropbox, Jitsi, Meet and so on. Now comes our fourth and final component of the online teaching called assessment. Assessment is important to check the progress of learning for both students and teachers. For students because it enables a student for their self-reflection. For assessment including multiple choice questions, my suggestion is Google Forms. To create scheduled graded quiz using Google Forms, check my linked video. The complete training video is there in the description section of this video. For subjective evaluation where descriptive type of questions are being provided, again my advice is to go with Google Forms. For submission of documents, for example, term paper, assignment, essay, etc., my suggestion is Google Docs. Why Google Docs? Because no need to email the documents back and forth, drastically reducing the bandwidth and email overload. Instructors can comment, students can respond everything online, real time. It's very convenient and it works seamlessly with low internet speed and bandwidth. So what is the take home message of this video? All you need to do with starting up with online teaching is just four things. Number one, a way to disseminate the course contents. Number two, a way to foster two-way interactions. Number three, a way to foster the group communication. And number four, a mean for assessment. Traditionally, Indian education has been skewed towards teachers. It's very much teacher-centric. As the saying goes, Gurur Devo Pavaha. 
teacher is God. In this extreme teacher-centric system, students turn into even slaves and wash the feet of their teachers. See the shocking news that I have read a couple of years back. The link is provided in the description section of this video. Needless to say that the role of teacher in our society is overhyped. In reality, the teacher's role is to act like a facilitator, to facilitate the learning process. Yes, teachers are not really meant for content providers. Two-way interactions and group discussions are extremely important, friends. So as micro-teaching, asking students to teach others. Yet another much-hyped component of online teaching is the video component. Mind that for real-time group interaction, video is entirely optional. Group audio conferencing or group call via Jitsi or Google Meet does the work very efficiently and saves a lot of bandwidth. Hosting the lectures on the YouTube has a lot of advantages. Audio lectures can also be delivered as podcast, a very simple solution yet oftentimes overlooked. Please don't forget Oxam's Razor. Always prefer simplicity over complicated solutions. Also, don't forget that the preparation is key. To get a course website up and running, it might take a few weeks. But once this initial phase is done, the maintenance task won't take much time, friends. Here is a favorite record of me by Abraham Lincoln. If I had six hours to chop down a tree, I would spend first four hours sharpening the eggs. Yes, preparation is the key. Hope this video has been useful to you. If you like this video, please click thumbs up, share it in relevant groups and subscribe to my channel. I will see you again and have a nice day.